Hey guys, it's Ryan. This is going to be my second video on hemostasis, and we're going to talk about the secondary hemostasis, or the coagulation cascade. Now, if you haven't already, please, please check out my first video on primary hemostasis, where we talk about the platelet pathway. And I really want to stress that these two things, although they have a common goal in creating a clot, they're two entirely different processes. So this is a slide from our first video on hemostasis, and um, we talked about these other uh, phases. So in this video, we're really going to hone in on coagulation, or secondary hemostasis. So again, here's all this crazy uh, diagrams with numbers and, and arrows and everything. It's super overwhelming. So we're going to really try to simplify this process. So when you're done watching this video, you have a better idea of how to uh, study, at least memorize, some of this stuff. So this is a kind of simple table I put together for each coagulation factor in the pathway and where they're made in the body. Now we don't have time to talk through all of this, but you can always go back to it later for reference. I thought it might be helpful just to have all this information clearly laid out. And note that a vast majority of them are synthesized in the liver. So, here I have listed the numbers of the factors involved in the coagulation cascade. So how this works is each factor activates the factor below it. So if I drew a couple arrows here, this factor would activate the factor downstream, and 11 would become 11A, A for activated. And then 11A would turn factor 9 into 9A, and 9A would turn factor 10 into 10A, and so on. Now, I don't have the A's listed because it just makes things a bit more complicated than they have to be. So let's start at the bottom of the cascade, the end. So the clot is obviously our goal, and factor 1 is at the end, and aptly named because it is number one. It's the most important factor of the pathway. Now if you go back to our table, one is fibrinogen. Now where did we see fibrinogen before? Well, if you watched my first video, we talked about fibrinogen in the platelet pathway. It was the Velcro responsible for the aggregation of platelets to each other. So how does this all link together? Well, you may be wondering, how does the body know where to activate this coagulation cascade? Well, at the giant plug of platelets coated in a mesh of fibrinogen, the substrate for this entire cascade. And this is basically why our blood isn't just a giant clot. It only clots where we have a platelet plug with fibrinogen on it. So we have two separate pathways here. We have intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway, both of which interact and converge on this common pathway, which is shared between the two. Factor 10, or Roman numeral X, is the central location, which is kind of nice to remember because X always marks the spot. So let's start with the extrinsic pathway. It's triggered by external trauma that causes blood to escape the vessel. The damaged endothelium expresses tissue factor, which is factor uh, three here, and which jumpstarts the pathway. So it's usually quicker than the intrinsic pathway and the first to kind of start everything up. Three activates seven, which activates 10, and now we're in the common pathway. So 10 works with 5 to activate 2, which activates 1. And just to throw this in here, 2, 1 and 13 act, uh, work together, the smallest and the largest number. So that's uh, nice to remember as well. Now we've talked at length about factor 1 already, but now let's talk about factor 2, which is prothrombin. When activated, it becomes thrombin. 
And thrombin, or factor 2a, is perhaps the second most important factor because it activates a bunch of other enzymes. Uh, it activates uh, 5, it activates 7, and 8, 11, 13, and so it basically is um, creating a bunch of positive feedback here. Now if it's activating 11, this enables us to spark the intrinsic pathway. But you may be thinking, hey, what about factor 12? It's not one of the ones activated by thrombin, so what is it doing all the way up here? Well, that's a good question. Uh, trauma can expose collagen on the inside of blood vessels, which can activate factor 12. But it's not necessary for clotting to occur because we have other ways to activate pathways. So 12 goes to 11. We skip 10 to go to 9, and then go back to 10. Now 8 works with 9, which is convenient because, well, 7, 8, and 9 are all lined up in the same row, at least in my drawing here. So now might be a good time to mention hemophilia, which comes from the Greek meaning roughly uh, love or loving to bleed. Now these are people with a hereditary condition where they bleed rather easily, and that's because there's a deficiency in one of these factors for hemophilia A, a for 8, that would be uh, hemophilia A is a deficiency in factor 8. Hemophilia B is a deficiency in factor 9. Hemophilia C is a deficiency in factor 11, which is nice to remember because they're all located next to each other in the intrinsic pathway. Now another question you may have is, how does this cascade stop? We've talked a lot about a bunch of positive feedback, a bunch of arrows and stuff, but what's there to inhibit everything so we don't clot out of control? Well, that's another good question, and there are many things like antithrombin, protein C, protein S, which inhibit factors, and the body's natural balance to clot formation is plasmin, an enzyme which cuts uh, fibrin up. So how about um, testing for bleeding? Well, we can um, use a PT test or INR, International Normalized Ratio, which is basically a normalized PT for different lab materials. And the, this uh, test, these tests here are for patients on warfarin. And a nice way to remember this is the last three letters of the drug warfarin, are R I N, and just if we reorganize them, I N R, and this the normal range for a test result is about 11 to 15 seconds for um, the uh, test result to be positive. A PTT is for patients on heparin, another anticoagulant, or a patient with hemophilia because now we're testing for the intrinsic pathway where um, we talked about those factors are involved. The normal range for this test is about something like 25 seconds. It's longer than PT because there are more factors involved. And also another easy way to remember is PTT is longer. It has more letters than PT. So basically, if a patient's on an anticoagulant, they're inhibiting the clotting process, and so the times for clotting to occur in these tests will increase if a patient's on an anticoagulant. So let's talk about those. Now, anticoagulants, I really want to make a, an important point here, are different than antiplatelet medications, which we talked about in the last video, because these drugs affect the coagulation cascade not the platelet pathway. A ton of people and doctors say that, for example, aspirin is an anticoagulant. No, no, no. Aspirin inhibits platelet activation by blocking COX-1 and thromboxane-2 synthesis. While it is a blood thinner, 
aspirin does not affect the coagulation cascade that we just talked about at all, and so it is not considered an anticoagulant. Sorry, I just want to make, it, made, made that super, super clear. So why would a patient be taking an anticoagulant? For a lot of the same reasons as an antiplatelet, they could be reducing risk of MI or a stroke. Um, patients with AFib, prosthetic heart valves, history of MI, CVA, or DVT, you know, a bunch of reasons. So we have uh, warfarin, which I already mentioned. Um, it basically blocks production synthesis of uh, vitamin K, and these are the vitamin K-dependent clotting factors, factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. If we go back to this, I had them highlighted in red, and it's nice to remember because they form a neat little Y here in this coagulation cascade drawing. So those four in red are the ones that warfarin affects. Now heparin pulls thrombin and antithrombin together, and so that's how it sort of um, blocks the coagulation cascade. It um, speeds up that negative feedback reaction. Apixaban, um, also known as Eliquis, directly inhibits factor 10A, so that's how it stops the process. Now dabigatrin is a direct thrombin inhibitor, or DTI, because it binds directly to thrombin, or factor 2A, at its active site inhibiting it. So that's just some examples of how we can pull everything together, how the mechanism of action of those drugs is actually pretty simple when we have a drawing like this and understand how it works. Alright guys, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a, a like, a comment on what you'd like to see next, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Alright guys, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.